Uh, I'm Marissa Fernholtz, and I'm a PhD student in the Department of Communication Arts, and I'm happy to be introducing Dr. Shanera Reed Brinkley today. Dr. Shanera Reed Brinkley is currently a visiting scholar in the Humanities Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Her research is in the areas of rhetoric, critical cultural studies, media studies, African American studies, gender and sexuality studies, and urban studies. She specializes in the study of race and gender in public address and advocacy, media, and culture. She is a national award winner for her research on critical theory, black feminist theory, gender, and hip-hop culture. Her current book project, Young, Black, and Political, Radical Activism, Argument Culture, and Civil Society, examines black youth politics and activism in the educational context. The central questions of this project are, how do black youth discuss race-centered political questions, and what kinds of rhetorical and bodily performances do they utilize to engage in public argument? So in addition today's talk, uh, to today's talk, I'd like to invite you to join Dr. Reed Brinkley for uh, another lecture tomorrow in this room uh, titled Black, Red Black Radical Rhetorics, a Case Study in Black Youth Activism, uh, and an open seminar Thursday uh, at 1220 in Social Sciences for faculty, students, and the public. In her talk for today, Anti-Blackness anti and the Political, Millennials, Black Intellectuals, and the Reshaping of American Politics, Dr. Reed Brinkley will meditate on the Trump effect in American politics and the important role she sees black millennials playing on future elections. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shanera Reed Brinkley. So of course I came up with that title before I actually wrote my presentation. So I'm going to hopefully cover all of those things that that title indicates that I am going to talk about. What I hope to do, or at least I want to describe how I've set up the distinctions between the two lectures that I'm giving so you can see why you would want to come to the second lecture if, you've he if you're here to hear me today. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the theoretical work that I'm doing in terms of setting up a theoretical conversation for the book project that I'm currently working on. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, Afro-pessimist theory, which is the study of anti-blackness, and I will talk about that in relationship to the study of rhetoric. And what I'm particularly interested in is for um, is for, for the study of rhetoric, we're really interested in the idea that we can speak our way out of problems, right? So we can communicate to one another, we can have effective communication, we can deliberate together, and then we can make effective choices or decisions based on that communication practice. And so I've read a lot of the research on public deliberation specifically around issues of race, and it is horrifyingly sad. Uh, most rhetoricians who study the relationship between rhetoric and public deliberation in the context of an interracial conflict over race have all decided and determined that it is almost impossible to resolve race issues in an interracial deliberation setting. Um, and they are, they are at a loss to explain why. Why is it we are not able in an interracial conversation about race to come together uh, across race and make effective decisions about how to change the circumstance even if we all see it. So that's sort of where my research is coming from and at first I wanted to find that holy grail, that thing that demonstrated that we can come together across race issues and deliberate together and make differences, make changes. Um, and so I started sort of a study of that in a very small pocket of um, college policy debate, which I'll talk a little bit about, that's sort of what the case study is about. But really the reason to be studying college policy debate was because they were having a racial conflict where they were attempting to deliberate over issues of race and I wanted to see if they were coming up with a example of how we could do it and how it could be effective and of course my research showed me the same thing that everybody else's rhetorical research shows which is there is something about race when we have to talk about racism, particularly structural racism, not just you can't call me a nigger, we all sort of get in our culture that that's not acceptable, right? But when you start talking about how structural racism functions, which is not about your personal opinion about who I am as a black person, but is about the ways in which our very society is structured to produce anti-blackness and to sustain white privilege, that conversation is incredibly difficult to have. 
So it took me doing a bunch of research and reading about uh, the study of anti-blackness and where the Afro-pessimists were coming from in the study of uh, the ontological, the political ontological positioning of the black body. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. How's the black body pol politically, ontologically positioned in the context of American civil society and in relationship to the state? And that's, I think, where the problem for rhetoric e exists and what I will sort of end with or conclude with for this presentation which is we can't talk ourselves out of anti-blackness because it is a issue of political ontology and as much as we try to butt our heads and change the material <coughs> circumstances that we are that we lived on that we live under our very society, the very nature of American democracy, our constitution, our laws, our institutions are constituted by its relationship to anti-blackness. In other words, we don't know what it means to have freedom or rights to be a citizen. We don't understand any of those concepts outside of its relationship to the black slave. Without the black slave, we have no under idea what freedom means. Not in the American context, not how we have defined and developed our society. And as a result of that, we can't resolve anti-blackness by trying to do small tinkering fixes to the structure itself. Um, and so the Afro-pessimists, as I'll talk about a little bit, but one of them in particular, Frank Wilderson, says that in order to end anti-blackness, we would have to end the world. And what he means by that is we'd have to end civil society. We'd have to end America's current instantiation or relationship to the state. We would have to revamp democracy from the ground up. It's not something that we can resolve by passing legislation, for example. So those are sort of the ideas that I'm grappling with. So here's the structure I, th uh, I think that'll be useful for you all to follow the talk. First, I want to do a brief introduction of myself and actually describe what my research is. And you did an excellent one. And I want to be a little bit more specific than that introduction so you can sort of get an idea of who I am as a scholar since I'm going to be here for a few days. After I do that, I want to briefly describe what the book project is about so that when I get to the section on theory, when I'm using examples from the debate community, you'll understand what those examples are about and what it is that I'm attempting to sort of draw on uh, when I'm sort of talking about debate in order to talk through the theory of rhetoric and anti-blackness. Um, once I finish that theory stuff, I'm going to move away from the uh, written presentation itself into what I think is the more interesting part of this lecture, which is thinking about the current state of the black political in the context of the Trump and Clinton election, in the context of the difficulties that the DNC is having sustaining the black millennial vote after Obama, and what I see as the potential possibilities and problems for the future in terms of the growth of the black community in its relationship to politics and in its relationship to the DNC and what all of that may have to do with uh, anti-blackness and this idea of structural racism because I think that most of us sort of realize with the sort of rise of Black Lives Matter and then Hillary uh, sort of putting certain kind of vocabulary in her mouth, things like structural racism or intersectionality which are language that we hear coming out of this Democratic presidential candidate those are markers of an evolution in change in the electorate that we should be paying attention to. And particularly, I think that the DNC uh, is in a lot of trouble if it cannot figure out a way to speak to black millennials over the next 12 years of election cycles. We may be in a moment where the DNC cannot depend on the black vote in presidential elections. And if that is true, then the DNC cannot win presidential elections. Uh, in the near future. So I want to talk about that and what that may mean for the political. All right, so the introduction first. We are witnessing significant shifts around race and ethnicity in our social, cultural, and political environment. The rise of the Black Lives Matter movement out of a generation considered to be so wrapped up in commodified identity and self-aggrandizement that they could not be depended upon to carry the torch of political freedom. And we are also in the moment, the troubling moment, of Donald Trump's popularity, whose blatant racism, sexism, ableism, and xenophobia has characterized the election, which indicates an acceleration of racial class and clash and conflict in American society. 
The so-called hip-hop generation has been critical to the growing protests and direct actions around the country in response to police brutality and state-sponsored killings. The anger, frustration, discontent, and apathy with government structures and civil society, often expressed in hip-hop music, drives the tone of activism and protest. The intertwining of hip-hop culture and black youth politics in this moment may have significant implications for American culture and politics for the future. Scholars situated to study this relationship and its continued development are well positioned to produce writings that help test the cogency and effectiveness of different forms of political protest and direct action tactics. I specialize in the study of public address and advocacy and media and culture. Each area oscillates around my interest in African American representation, culture, politics, history, and performance in the U.S. context. My interests focus on the intersectional relationship between the politics of gender, class, and sexuality, and the cultural development, practice, and performance of blackness. In other words, how does race-centered social cultural identity and performance influence practices of resistance through political engagement? and social activism. What does it mean for those disenfranchised by difference to resist through public argument in media and public deliberative spaces? Through my research, I have attempted to engage these questions seeking to identify and define the traditional norms of public deliberation and media representation that may reproduce racial exclusions in communicative and popular spaces. However, while tracing the dominant practices that produce exclusions is a significant part of my research, I'm also interested in exploring the alternative discourses and rhetorics of direct protest by which African Americans negotiate and recreate deliberative spaces and mediated representation through black cultural practice and performance. My current research, as Marissa noted, centers black youth politics and activism in the urban setting. How do black youth discuss race-centered political questions and what kinds of rhetorical and bodily performances do they utilize to engage in public argument? How do black youth political movements develop and institute strategies of resistance against the dominant frames of hegemonic educational norms in an effort to build alternative intellectual traditions? How do black youth engage in political action in an effort to bring change to urban communities? In addition, how does hip-hop culture, politics, and performance influence activism amongst black youth? My current book project is tentatively titled Young Black and Political, Radical Activism, Argument, Culture, and Civil Society. The project is a rhetorical history and criticism of the development of a race-centered social movement that began in 2000 in the college policy debate community. College debate is a competitive tournament style co-curricular activity that pits students from hundreds of different institutions of higher learning in an intellectual argument about the pros and cons of US government policy and the significant economic and political issues facing the nation. The debate activity produces individuals with extensive political knowledge and excellent communication skills. And debaters go on to become politicians, political advocates, lawyers, professors, researchers for political think tanks, and more. An activity that has been historically white, male, and representative of the middle to upper class, policy debates benefits have often been unavailable to the poor, women, and racial ethnic minorities. A critical mass of black students in college debate are questioning the structure structural racism and privilege that reproduces racial exclusions in the college debate community and prevents black students from achieving the heights of success in national competition. Arguing that the debate community reproduces and maintains structural inequities, making black participation in debates statistically anomalous, the students engage in debates by disrupting the normative performative and competitive strategies. They do so by incorporating hip hop music and performance, spoken word, personal experience, and organic intellectuals into their speeches, a practice completely disruptive to the more conservative style of traditional debate presentation. So I won't spend a lot of time talking about the case study, which is college policy debate and what the students are doing. I'll spend the time in the second lecture focused on the case study. But I do want you to sort of be aware of what the movement is about and what is happening in college policy debate because of some of the examples that I'll use to deal with the theory section. I want to show you a video. Let me get out of the PowerPoint for a second. I want to show you a video clip of a debate round 
from, I believe this is about 2012. I started tracking this movement in 2004 and for disclosure purposes, or not really disclosure, just as a way for you to get how an academic rolls up on a good project. Uh, is you know, I was a college, I was a high school and college debater myself, and as a high school debater, I came out of the pilot program for what became the National Urban Debate League, which has gone from the one city in Atlanta, which is where I'm from, to more than 23, 24 cities across the nation. And so, whereas my high school sort of integrated the Georgia high school circuit, which was all white, the Urban Debate League has now nationally integrated the national high school circuit. Um, and so, what began to happen is one. Once those high school debaters started to filter in to the high school circuit, it provided a ready population of um of students to recruit for colleges, right? And that makes sense to you because colleges are all about diversity. I, we need more diversity, we want to recruit diversity. They can't retain them, but they definitely will go recruit them. So they're recruiting, right, out of the high school policy debate community, these urban debate leaguers who are being trained in high school debate. I left the Urban Debate League at about the age of 24 because I'd been the poster child for the program since I was about 20 years old. So I'd been flown to everywhere you can imagine Imagine that they set up an urban debate league. They flew me in to talk to the administrators, to put on exhibition debates for the students, to stand up and basically say, I'm a ghetto kid gone good, and you can do what I have done. And by that time, I was a college debater at Emory. Um, I did not have to pay to go to school at Emory. Emory was one of the best debate teams in the country. And so I stood up on a very consistent basis, basis for years, describing to these students that if they took my path, they could get there too. And there were all of these universities throwing scholarship money at these urban debaters because they wanted that diversity on their team. But what became really clear to me very early on is that the pilot program for the Urban Debate League was not the model that they ended up using nationally. So when in the pilot program for my high school, we integrated to the National Georgia High School Circuit immediately, which meant we just went to tournaments like everybody else and had to compete against the private schools, the rich suburban white schools. You just had to, you know, they threw us in the water and were like, you got to sink or swim. But the national program decided that they were worried about the student's ability to survive in that kind of environment. They were worried that the students would quit, they wouldn't want to participate. And so they decided instead to have segregated leagues. And so the segregated leagues meant that just urban debate leaguers were debating other urban debate leaguers. Does that make sense to you? So when I was standing up and saying, you can be me, you can be competitive like me on the college circuit, by the time I was a senior as a college debater, I was the most successful black woman in the history of college policy debate. And I was standing up in front of other young debaters, young black debaters, and saying, you can follow my path. But I fundamentally realized that they could not because the segregated league truncated the experience of competition, which lessened the intellectual benefit that the students were getting from participation. So what we were finding was that these students were being recruited to debate on college debate teams, but did not have the skills to be competitively successful at the national college debate level. And so it became incredibly frustrating for the students and what they did instead of feeling like we are not good enough, we aren't smart enough to do these things that these other rich white schools are doing, they started to study the activity itself. And what they decided was, we're going to study this activity, and it became very clear to them early on how structural racism functioned in the activity itself, i.e., debate rounds, debate competition, debate language, its rhetorical practice is designed to speak to political elites. And it's designed to speak to white political male elites. That is what the activity has been designed to do since the 50s when it started tournament style competition. And these students fundamentally realized that that was not the kind of political training that students of color needed in order to be effective members of the civic and political community. And they decided that there were other frames, other forms of debate argumentation that they could use that would allow them to get at issues that particularly affected African Americans and then it grew from there to the Latino kids jumped in we have Asian kids making these arguments they're Jewish kids we have the trans rage population it just opened up space for questioning of the structure so I want to show you a video example 
of uh, one of the debaters doing a introduction to a policy debate speech. Now I'm going to show you the hip hop introduction, but keep in mind this is a nine minute speech this, this student is giving. We're just going to listen to about the first minute or so. And the first minute is in hip hop form, but the rest of that eight minute speech is an eight minute discussion of why we should reject any attempts to resolve or solve democracy because democracy, democracy itself is anti-black. And they read a bunch of evidence from some of the most significant black scholars of our time who are questioning whether or not civil society or the state are salvageable in the context of anti-blackness. And so what I want you to pay attention to is this is not just this is not just regular hip hop music, right, where you can listen to it and, you know, the beat's, the beat's hot, you know, and this kid's got mad flow. But listen to what he's saying and listen to the language he's using and think about the metaphors he's creating. Because this, this young man is a high level theorist. Right, he's read more than most graduate students on blackness, and this is him as a junior in college. Get out. It'll get louder. Get out. Get out between the gap of explaining and resisting and listening in the certain gate wall. I stay missing the nigga from the corner whose mission to go to college, position to be a scholar, still relegated to swallow. Object of your oppression, objectifies his conceptions in college to gain knowledge in white spaces and stepped in. Pop, knock, knock on the door, but never let in. Fiasco, we let the get go. A little weapon against deception. Don't accept the misconceptions. The world was superimposed on my progression. Resolutions, solutions, dreams, and illusions, delusions of institutions of slave blood running through them, whiteness over black, righteousness and crack, after I escape, they trying to signify his back, the human location can't put us on the map, I pull heaven from the sky to bring your world to the track, heaven into hell, was slavery to jail, then the brain of me is criminal, can't provide me bail, your world is in jail, and we're Jonathan Jackson, death is inevitable, and suicide is action, yo. Okay, so... This debate round that we are that we just saw this speech from, this is the negative team, and the affirmative team is attempting to talk about why we need to be figuring out new ways of talking about democracy. We need to be, learn to practice democracy in the American classroom because the nation or the state is going out and engaging in international communities in ways that are not representative of the goals, the beliefs, the values of American democracy. So that's what the affirmative says. The negative who Ben represents, this is Ben Morgan from uh, Towson University in Baltimore, which has one of the most significant and prominent urban debate leagues. Uh, ben is trying to say that Ben's going for an argument of we need to stop trying to fix democracy and we need to get to the point where we're willing to engage in revolutionary suicide, which is why he mentions Jonathan Jackson, right? So his, their perspective on the negative is we have to destroy the system. There is no resolving it. There is no fixing it. We must collapse civil society because democracy will never be responsive to anti-blackness. Now these debaters, the black debaters on the college debate circuit get away with saying a lot of things, but one of the things that I do want to point out about sort of what Ben is talking about, because this is a strain of black radical argumentation in debate, which is one that questions the very value of white futurity, right? It questions the very value of white survivability, right? In other words, these black students are asking the question should white people survive? That is their question. That is what they are debating about in a lot of ways is white futurity. Because for them, when I get to the theory part, you'll start to understand, for them, they are coming from the fundamental stance that black life has no value in American society. That's why you have a movement called Black Lives Matter. Because fundamentally, we, our lives don't actually matter in American society. And so what they are saying is, given that we live in a world where our lives don't matter, and for them, they're looking at the statistics. They're looking at the history, right? They're saying it's white people that have produced global warming. 
It is your consumption habits that have destroyed the planet. It is your means of engaging with one another that produces massive level conflicts that can result in nuclear war. They are saying that it is the white European tradition, its culture, that produces the situation where humanity may face extinction. So the question for them is, do you deserve to live? Do you deserve to be here? And for many of them, the question is no. And it's not that they're saying anyone should go out and kill you. But what they are saying is that your life, the way in which you have structured life around whiteness, should be destroyed. Because as long as whiteness exists, as long as the values associated with whiteness, the belief system, the structure of reality, as long as whiteness is sustained in that, in that way, then the worst B-movie apocalypse film that you have ever seen is inevitable in the status quo. That is what white people have produced. And I'm not afraid to say that. That is what white culture has produced. It is what white government has produced. It is what white society has produced. So the question is, what do we do with that? And can we speak our way out of it? And at the beginning, I said my answer is no, we can't. I don't know what we're going to do about it. So don't ask me at the end of this lecture. I don't know. I do not know. Because there are too many white people. They have too much power. It is very difficult to take that power away. And they are not willing to give it up. So I do not know. I think we're all screwed because white people are in charge. I think that we would all be screwed. Now, let me keep, let's, let's clear up some language here. I'm saying white people because I want you to feel implicated. So if you're feeling uncomfortable right now, good for you. You should be. And the reason why I want you to feel that discomfort is because I want you to walk away and start looking out at the world and looking, seeing what we are producing. Seeing the world as it is and watching it the way that I see it, which is an out of control train that is about to crash. Unless we do something, we have to make some changes. Global warming will not be resolved because <coughs> white people with money don't want to give up that privilege. They don't. And as long as they don't, rich white people use more resources, consume more resources, cause more global warming, have the highest carbon footprint of anybody else in the world. So we are doomed to die because people will not take it seriously and they will not do anything to change it. And that fundamental change we're looking for is not some tinkering with Donald Trump's climate policy. That's not going to do it. We are going to have to fundamentally change the entire way our society functions to survive climate change. But we are unwilling to make those changes, which is why I say we are all screwed. Unless something exigent happens that disrupts white life, not those poor black people in Katrina, not those poor people of color in Bangladesh, not those African nations that are saying we're going to lose a large section of land mass if you agree to a two degree hike at the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement was designed to save white people. And it sacrificed communities of color. Because those lives don't matter. Okay, sweet. Now let's get to the theory. Because I want to talk through the theory of what I've just said to you, right, in just sort of colloquial language. All right. So... I'm taking this section that I'm about to read to you um, as a excerpt from a book chapter that will come out in the Oxford Handbook of Voice Studies where I am sort of writing about college policy debate and what I think about the theory of rhetoric and anti-blackness. Um, and so I'm going to read that section uh, to you and it's fairly extensive but once I finish this section then I'll stop reading and then I'll talk to you again and people tend to like that better anyway. But stay with me um, because I'm trying to 
it's easier to read this to you because I'm trying to parse through some really complicated theory. So stick with me th during the reading and I'll try to make sure I'm not going too fast. If I am, hold your hand up. But I'm a debater and debaters speak uh, almost 400 to 500 words per minute during competition. And so I can speak fast and not even realize that it's happening. So if you need me to slow down, just throw your hand in the air and I'll try to pay attention to that. Okay. Rhetoric scholar Eric Watts considers the nature of rhetorical voice to be a happening, rather than something that an individual has. Voice is not a noun nor a possession. Instead, it operates as a verb, as a process. It is created in and through relational negotiations within rhetorical moments. Voice is a happening, a brief moment of recognition that allows the black to enter the rhetorical moment. The black cannot have voice because the black cannot have speech. The black is always already not recognizable as a speaking subject. Thus, for Watts, the black may temporarily account for this lack of speaking positionality by creating the happening, the moment of voice. Watts' understanding of voice requires negotiation among speakers and audiences marked by obligations and anxieties and produced by the ethical and emotional dimensions of discourse. In other words, to make voice a happening requires a recognition by those engaged in the rhetorical moment. Yet the politics of recognition for the black body are necessarily tied to the social and political narratives attached to the black body as a speaking body. The black body represents a dirt or a stain, or to use symbolic anthropologist Mary Douglas's language, a pollutant on and in the social body, one that must be controlled and contained. That's why we have police shooting black people in the street, because the black body must be controlled. It has to be contained. If the black body can never be rendered fully invisible, then that body must somehow be contained. Its access is subdued to produce a form of the black body that can become recognizable within the space of whiteness. Society tames blackness by requiring those marked by blackness to demonstrate their commitment to the norms of whiteness through the performance of the body, generally a mimicking of whiteness. If whiteness is normative, then in order for the speaking black body to be heard or come to voice, it must perform in a manner consistent with that norm. For example, the stylistic norms of the college debate community are inextricably tied to the social performance of identity attached to racialized bodies. Style includes bodily performance, how our bodies signify as parts of the rhetorical process. In other words, body performance is integral to communal, to communal practices in debate that produce a social and competitive environment hostile to blackness. Here's what I mean. If the image of the nationally successful debater is a white, male, and economically privileged body, then the stylistic practices of those bodies become the standard by which all other bodies are evaluated. Their practices, their behaviors, their identities become the models or the thrones upon which others must sacrifice their identities in the pursuit of the ballot. That's what you sign when you win at a debate tournament in a round, judge signs a ballot to say who won, to pursue the ballot or the win. So racially different bodies must perform that difference according to the cultural norms of the debate community. For black students, it can often mean changing their appearance, standardizing language practices, and eschewing their cultural practices. In essence, in order to have an opportunity for achieving in debate competitions, black students must performatively whiten. Acting black is problematic because those performative identities are not recognizable in the normative frame of debate practice. In fact, blackness signifies a difference, an opposite, a negative differential. It is not that the debate community explicitly operates to exclude people based on race. Rather, it competitively rejects black presence or normative non-white presence. It is the combination of cultural values, behavioral practices, and the significance of black flesh that produce barriers to meaningful inclusion. So let's look at, sorry, now I gotta put in my password. So this is one of the questions I think that I told you at the beginning. I just want to let you see it in print, right? Does the black, particularly the black that performs blackness, 
have political voice in a civil society constituted by anti-blackness. So this whole conversation that I'm having now about bodily performance, that's a very central interest for me. Because the black body cannot cannot not be black unless it can pass for white. Um, in that context, uh, blackness is already a problem for speech and voice, but what I'm interested in is what happens when the black body performs blackness purposefully, and then how does whiteness, white society, white institutions react to that? So we're going to talk a little bit about the Afro-pessimist now. And I sort of tried to um, just uh, jot down some sort of bullet points of what's in this section, but also as ways to give you an idea of what the Afro-pessimists are talking about, too, sort of what are the main themes or subjects that are appearing in their work. For Afro-pessimists, the group of black scholars who have popularized the study of anti-blackness, the black is juxtaposed against what it means to be master, human, citizen, and subject in a manner that is constitutive of U.S. civil society. The U.S. is built upon a notion of freedom and liberty that necessitated the negative dialectic of the slave to define the parameters of the nation state. This foundational relationship has sutured together U.S. civil society and continues to do so. For theorist Frank Wilderson, the grammar of black or slave suffering is marked by accumulation and fungibility, a relation of being owned and traded. The human's white grammar of suffering is marked by alienation and exploitation. The grammar of black slave suffering is not recognizable within the frame of human white suffering. It can only be misrecognized as alienation and exploitation. Now I want to stop here for a second uh, just to say that what I've noticed in this sort of 10 year <clears throat> longitudinal study of this racial conflict in this interracial setting is that I am often astounded by how much, by, what I'm astounded by is listening to black students speak to a majority white audience and watching the majority white audience have no real complex understanding of what the students are trying to say. And so it's not that they don't hear the words, it's that they don't, they don't understand a grammar of suffering that is the existence of black people, right? It's like, it's like when you're as a black person attempting to describe the day-to-day -day realities of being black in American society, it is very difficult for those who don't have that experience to understand when you say, I experience racism in this situation. Really often what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis are called racial microaggressions, right? So microaggressions that white people do on a day-to-day -day basis, whether this is grabbing your purse because a black dude got on the elevator, or it's switching to the other side of the street because you see more than three black men walking down the street together. The, like the racial microaggressions that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis are compounded. And so when we try to explain the harm that that produces and what that harm means in terms of how we have to live day by day, that every day is a struggle in a society dominated by white people when you don't have white skin privilege. That that pain, that suffering, is incredibly difficult to get white people to understand what that means, not because they don't have empathy, because they do. Because, but the only way white people can empathize with that is to put themselves in that situation. But because white people's experience of things like discrimination or harm in that way is about alienation, right, that kind of experience, they don't understand what we're saying when we say our experience is really about accumulation and fungibility. Like our experience is about the fundamental fact that our entrance into American society is about being bought and sold. And that is a different register for a grammar of suffering. And that grammar of suffering makes no sense in a white dominated society that has a different register for understanding suffering. So that sort of the crux, I think, of what the problem is when, I, when black students are talking. Now, I'm black, and I'm watching these black students talk, and I'm like, yeah, I get that. Totally get it. But I'm watching white people, some of which are very close friends. I've been a debater since I was 14 years old. Like, we maintain our relationship. So we're talking about people that I've known since I was a child, people that I respected, people who were good to me as a young debater and helped create an atmosphere that was more welcoming, to watch those people be so confused 
about it, it confused about why these black students think that direct action protest in the debate environment is a legitimate response when we should just be getting together and holding conferences and talking through these issues with one another and then we can come up with policies and plans and institutional practices and changes that can resolve these issues why do you have to bring it into competition where it becomes a win or a loss well guess why because you only respect the win or loss our community only has changed. I've been watching this for 10 years. Our community has changed drastically. But it is because white people keep losing. It's because they're losing the debates. And it's because they won't go to the black section of the library. They don't want to have to go read Fanon. They don't want to read black feminist theory. They don't want to read black trans studies. They don't want to do that research. And the more they reject doing it, the easier it is for the black students to beat them because they're going to do the research on black theory and what you're reading. So they're always up under what you have to say. They're always going to be smarter because you refuse to engage. And that's the circumstance. But part of the reason why that engagement is hard is because white students who are college students, these are all students. So I see them all as kids, right? For me, they're all in process. So when I'm saying white people, white students, keep in mind that I'm talking about college people. I'm a professor. They all kids to me. They're all growing to me. So while watching them, I often have to, I take some under my wing. The ones that I see that are struggling to try to understand, that are just not getting it, you have to take them to the side and I talk to them and they're just like, what do you want me to do, Shanera? I can't rap. I was like, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> That's probably a bad idea. But guess what? In the black section of the library, there are black scholars who critique hip hop. You can read some of them. You don't have to do hip hop. You don't have to be a rapper. Not all black people can rap. We still have things to say, right? So you have to, you, it's, a, it's a training ground to get even the white students to understand that non-engagement is not an option. You must engage, right? But the question is how to even train them to think about it, to how do you get white, a white student who's lived a very privileged, privileged economic condition so they've never understood hardship, how do you get them to understand when someone's saying, you know, I got, I got hauled up by the cops on the way to the basketball court on campus? And to them it's just like, well, what were you doing? That's what the white person asked the black person. The black person was like, I was being black. That's what I was doing. But that's the grammar of suffering that white people find it difficult to understand. When you can just say, I have done nothing wrong, but be black. That's what I did. I was black in a space marked by whiteness. And that's enough. That's enough to get you killed. It's enough for you to lose your job. It's enough for all kinds of harm just because your skin is black. It has nothing to do with who you are, what you have done, what you have said. Right, so I ride around, I'm a 40 year old black woman, and you would think that I should feel safe dealing with the cops, because I'm a 40 year old black woman, I'm middle class, I'm a professor, right? I sound smart when I talk to white people. That matters, if you didn't know, it does matter. It affects how white people treat you. So, I have a deathly fear of being pulled over by the cops. I'm not carrying no drugs, I don't have any weapons. But I know that my black skin is enough in the wrong moment that I could be Sandra Bland. And my mama could be having a talk on TV about how her daughter died in the jail. And I'm going to tell you, I got my cell phone next to me and I know how to get to Facebook Live real quick. Because I'm going to get on Facebook Live as that officer is approaching. I'm like, if they arrest me, I did not kill myself. For real. And that's a thing. Like, black women are doing that now. Whenever they get pulled over by the cops, they're going to call somebody, they're going to get on FaceTime Live. If they arrest me and I end up dead in a jail cell, I did not kill myself. I got too much to live for. Mm -hmm. So they have done something to me. That is the reality of the world for some people. And that level of day-to-day -day suffering, that level of day-to-day -day fear, that is very difficult to describe to someone who doesn't live with that day-to-day -day fear. So here's how, I hate doing analogies between race and gender, but I think sometimes they can be useful. 
And so when I'm talking to white feminists, for example, and I'm talking to white women, one of the things that I try to analogize for white women is the experience of the fear of rape and assault that women walk around with every day in society, which men don't really get. It's not because it is, it is the kind of thing that it, it is a every day you must be aware of your surroundings, right? Your mama trained you before you got anywhere near somebody's college. If you put your drink down, you leave it right there. You don't pick up and drink out of a cup that you left somewhere at a party. You pay attention. Don't be nowhere stuck in some room with a whole bunch of men you don't know. Though that is a everyday reality for women, right? An everyday reality of the fear of rape. And so what I try to get white women to try to do for a second is to understand that that is a very similar experience to what black people experience on a day-to-day -day basis. And then when you start talking about black women and black queers who then have that compounded, that fear compounded on a day-to-day -day basis, then you are starting to approach what I am attempting to say when I'm talking about a grammar of suffering. Does that make sense to y'all? Okay. Back to the manuscript. All right, we ended with this last sen these last couple of sentences to just remind us of where we came from here. The human white's grammar of suffering is marked by alienation and exploitation. The grammar of black slave suffering is not recognizable within the frame of human white suffering. It can only be misrecognized as alienation and exploitation. For the study of rhetoric, an understanding of the political ontology of the black as one that is necessarily defined by its status as slave object requires that we engage the question of whether or not the black has the capacity for recognition in the construction of the moment of voice. Watts would agree that the black does not have speech. That is why the production of voice is only a momentary process, a happening by which blacks can seek recognition. For the black, the body announces itself prior to speech, i.e. I am black before I ever open my mouth. So it follows that the black lacks capacity for speech because they approach the speaking moment as a non-recognizable subject and positioned as incapacity by the modalities of accumulation and fungibility. For the Afro-pessimist, capacity is made coherent in civil society by a necessary relationship to black incapacity. Wilderson notes that, quote, white human capacity in advance of the event of discrimination or oppression is parasitic on black incapacity. Without the Negro, capacity itself is incoherent, uncertain at best, end quote. Not only does the black lack the same capacity as the white in first approaching the speaking situation, she he enters the situation as incapacity. The black must battle with its political ontological condition as a precursor to the process of speaking, let alone the production of voice. Does that make sense to you all? You have to negotiate as a black speaker your blackness prior to the moment of speech in order to produce the moment of voice. Because you enter the speaking situation as a non-recognizable speaking subject because you represent incapacity. If the happening of voice depends on a relationality that produces, quote, a public acknowledgement of the ethics of speaking and the emotions of others, end quote, that's a Watts uh, quotation, the black is always already relegated to the position of the unethical speaker, which must defend and prove itself by seeking recognition from the human subject in civil society. Further, it necessitates that the black performatively and argumentatively approach the moment of voice with only the pretense of subjecthood and capacity, that the black must construct the pretense of being an ethical speaker while having no subject positioning to do so requires an inauthentic performance of the black object as white subject. If rhetorical situations require pretense and inauthentic inauthenticity, then they make unethical speaking the sin qua non of public speech for the black. The black must mimic the performance of human white capacity and becomes bound this is the important part. The black must mimic the performance of human white capacity and thus becomes bound by the grammar of alienation and exploitation to achieve recognition. In other words, the black must justify its blackness 
or perform itself in a manner consistent with white civil society to engage in a relational negotiation to produce the moment of voice. Such a practice supersedes and constitutes the ability of the white audience to recognize the black as an ethical speaker. As rhetoric theorist Amber Kelsey notes, from an Afro-pessimist perspective, the problem is not that the black is voiceless, so much as it is that the voice speech body of the black does not resonate. The slave is always already being attended to by the white other, but such recognition itself obliterates any possibility of social life for the slave." End quote. Full recognition of the black is not really possible in the rhetorical situation, for the black is the incoherence that constitutes the coherence of the human subject. In other words, the black cannot speak about black suffering without their appeals being read through the frame of alienation and exploitation. The grammar of black suffering remains unrecognizable and thus unacknowledgeable even in the moments where the black has produced the voice moment. Given these considerable obstacles, how does the Louisville team, that's the debate team that I'm studying for this movement piece, how does this team become successful and produce moments of recognition? Transforming the team from a persistent losing record to one of the most successful black debate teams in the history of national policy debate, it is clear this achievement could not have been possible without a communal recognition of Louisville's ethics and affect. And yet, in the moment where those negotiations waver or break down, anti-blackness as a structural antagonism produces insurmountable obstacles for engaging racialized conflict through discussion and deliberation. So that's the end of the sort of section on rhetoric uh, and sort of what I'm attempting to grapple with here, which is if we start thinking about rhetoric's relationship to political ontology, it becomes very complicated and difficult to make strategic plans for how rhetoric can respond to anti-blackness. Now, a, a lot of the readings that I assigned for the class that I'm gonna, uh, the seminar on Thursday are a number of these sort of Afro-pessimist reading and I find the ones that I did because they're trying to get at what do we do politically, like materially, Right, because there are actual people who are suffering real consequences from anti-blackness, structural racism in the status quo. So what do we do about that, even if we fundamentally recognize that there is no hope that civil society or the state will ever be responsive to the condition of anti-blackness for black people? So those things that I'm having people read are trying to get at how do we still operate in relationship to the state and civil society without any hope? Can I interrupt you? Yeah. And those readings are on the Haven Center website. Even if you're not going to be at that um, at that seminar, if this subject matter is interesting to you, right? Then what I did was choose four of the like best readings I thought where they're having conversations with one another to get at this idea of political hope. Uh, and the re or nihilism, right? Because some people who critique Afro pessimists are calling them nihilists, right? You're just like we shouldn't do anything, and the Afro pessimists are like, no, that is not at all what we're saying. We're saying we actually need to be smarter and more strategic, <coughs> right? Because we fundamentally understand that we are not able to get civil society and the state to move in ways that can resolve anti-blackness because there is no grammar of black suffering and that the grammar of black suffering is impossible in relationship to the grammar of human suffering. So that's sort of where we are, I think, in terms of rhetoric. I'm going to uh, speak for this last five minutes, and I'm going to do this real quick and dirty. Um, but I want to give you some idea of how this research is also I, I am not. A, I don't think of myself as a theorist, per se. Um, I work with theory, but theory for me is only important in as much as it helps explain what's happening with black people. Like, that's what my interest is in. What's going on with black people? What's happening structurally? And so for me, the theory often provides me with metaphors or language or helps me build connections. Uh, so I don't think of myself as a theorist. I think of myself as a materialist. So I'm actually more interested in material circumstance, material consequence, what's happening to black people materially as a result of anti-blackness, and the theory helps me to see what's happening materially. So that's why theory is important, and I want to say that for those of you that are graduate students that are trying to figure out what your relationship is to theory, uh, but your interest is really in material people, right? Theory is important because it helps you to track 
to think about, provide you with a vocabulary or a language to describe what you're seeing. You know, I remember being a 19 year old in college debate on a, uh, the year that uh, we were talking about environmental racism and having difficulty describing to debate judges why racism was a significant impact, just lacking the language to do it. And so that's why I say the theory has been really useful for me because it's just helped elevate my ability to use language vocabulary to describe what I intuitively see as a black woman. Right? I'm not going I don't need the academy to teach me how to go study black people. I really actually don't because we actually know more about ourselves than you do. Right? But what the academy was useful for was its process of explanation. Right, and its ability to give you language, texture, other people's metaphors that help you as you're looking at how power is functioning, that help you to map that. That's why theory is important for a person like me. Right, I don't have no intention, right, of writing some treatise. You know, I am not Derrida. You know what I mean? Like, I want, I want my work to mean and matter to actual black people in the context. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think theory d can do for you, is it helps you sort of map things, to pull things apart, to see the structure, gives you explanatory power. So really quick and dirty, I want to sort of talk about uh, the state of the black political as I see it. And I, I've been really fascinated by this subject for a while now during the election campaign uh, because I've got, I've got thousands of Facebook friends. And the reason I do is because I'm a really significant figure in debate because I'm the eldest of the elders in terms of Urban Debate League students. And I've kept my hands on everybody. I mentor, I coach, I do a lot. And so as a result, I'm friends with a lot of black millennials. And so I get to see the things that are coming across their pages, what conversations they're they're having. And during the election, what was coming across my Facebook feed was fascinating from black millennials. Because every time somebody like John Lewis would get on TV or Barack would get on TV to scold young black people for not supporting Hillary, I was thinking to myself, this is such a bad idea, dummy. Who do you have planning for you? This is a bad idea. Get John Lewis off the television and Barack, stop talking to us like you are daddy. <laughs> That's how black millennials responded to it, right? So in a lot of ways, Hillary lost votes because she went and got the black elders to come chastise the black millennials. And if you know anything about kids, <laughs> you know what I mean? they kids. They don't want to hear that. You can't come at them like that. So I was watching all of that progress and what I fundamentally realized is happening is that the black electorate is changing because the civil rights generation is going to die out and it is going to be replaced with Gen Xers who feel more closer to, bl to black millennials because they are all part of the hip hop generation. Right? So there is a anti-state, anti-government, we don't believe you care about us, our lives do not matter and we don't trust the DNC. That is contemporary young black America. The DNC is going to lose its black voting bloc in the next 20 years if it does not learn this lesson. And I remember this from Al, Sharp, Al Sharpton when he was running for president, Reverend, Reverend Sharpton. Did anybody pay attention to that? Because it was really funny. Back in the day, I think it was back in like 2004, maybe the 2004 election Sharpton was running. So Sharpton's made this joke during one of the DNC uh, presidential debates where he was like, you know, the Democrats need to learn or they need to understand. If, you, if, you, if we escort you to the dance, we expect for you to come home with us. That is the problem with black relationship to the DNC, which is the DNC, they at black churches eating fried chicken and collard greens and cornbread and trying to come talk to black people and, oh, I'm so comfortable with the black people and I love black people. And they do that during the election season to get the black vote. And black people are not finna vote in mass for the Republicans because they clearly crazy, right, when it comes to race. That's, what, that's how black vote functions. So generally, they have been able to depend on the black vote. But black millennials will not vote and not feel bad about it because they understand that the DNC has held the black vote hostage for generations. This is the situation we are finding ourselves in. Now, class conflict, which is also important in thinking about this conflict with black millennials. 
Class conflict, I'm taking these two vocabulary words that you see up here, aphristocracy and ghettocracy. I'm taking that from Michael Eric Dyson, Is Bill, uh, Is Bill Cosby Crazy book. I don't know if any of you read it. It was back in like, I read it maybe in about 2004 or five. But what Dyson's trying to get at is talking about the divergences within the black community. And this is pre-Black Lives Matter. But Dyson's trying to sort of understand where hip hop has sort of created divergences in the black community that were not necessarily foreseen. So for example, the aristocracy sort of represents uh, the black upper class. And this has always been a, a part of the black community since the end of slavery. So the black people who were able to be the first generation of those who were educated, our first doctors, lawyers, teachers, right? They create a black middle class. That becomes the black elite, the black higher echelon. That then becomes a means by which other black people are supposed to direct themselves. That's called the politics of respectability, how you behave, how you wear your hair, how you engage with white people because you need to be mimicking or performing aspects of whiteness in order to produce safety and access to success and benefits. So that's that sort of that's that sort of uh, uh, part or echelon of the black community, that black upper class that sort of represents those respectable, that's what we call them, we call them respectable Negroes, mm -hmm. right? These are the respectable Negroes, right? The kind that you want at your country club, they know how to act, you can have them at business meetings, you take them to dinner, right? They're gonna all be, they're gonna be respectable, respectable people. Versus the ghettocracy that started to develop in the 80s, right? Now, I love the ghettocracy because the ghettocracy does not, does not represent a class divergence per se. It is not just representative of the black poor because what has happened is that the advent and rise of NBA and NFL stars, rap and R&B artists, and their refusal to ascend to the aphristocracy in terms of their performance of respectability has created a different class Class, this ghettocracy, which yes, does represent poor and working class black people, but also some very rich parts of black America as well. Because the black people who are making the most, the people who are making the most increasing money in black America, those numbers go up highly around people who are sports stars or music artists, etc. Right? So the ghettocracy and the aristocracy have been in conflict like since slavery ended, basically. I mean, like since that first generation of respectable Negroes produced themselves, there's been conflict between these populations in terms of poor blacks and upper middle class blacks. Uh, but what we're seeing here with the ghettocracy, I think, is pulling away the power dynamic that the aristocracy has normally had in terms of sort of controlling or willing the direction of black politics. So the aristocracy is losing its power to persuade the black political community toward its sort of end goals or institutional goals, etc. The really the ghettocracy is becoming much more significant in influencing black millennial voters. And when we're talking about millennials, right, I'm not talking about 18 year olds because they're the sort of I generation, right? They're going to be even worse than black millennials, right? Their attitude will be even worse. So that's the I generation. I'm talking about people who are black millennials slash the hip hop generation really covers anybody who was born from 1976 till about 1995, maybe 98 at the latest, right? So that's that population. And so you're talking about, you know, people who are from in college to people who are like me with PhDs who uh, were not supporters of Hillary Clinton and uh, were very vocal about not being supportive. Now, I did vote for Hillary, right? But that's because I'm 40 and not 20. Right. And I've got a child and I have bills to pay. And like, you know, Trump seemed crazy to me. And I thought that was just a bad idea. But it's not because I trusted Hillary at all. Right. Hillary and Hillary does not speak to the black people who are the significant voting block. And if the Democrats don't decide fairly quickly that they've got to start choosing candidates that can very honestly and truthfully engage with black voters, they will lose that bl voting block. And it's not that the Republicans are going to pick it up necessarily, although Trump does try. I don't know if y'all noticed that every now and then Trump will try to put something in that's like, but black people, we still cool though. I don't usually target y'all, right? And what I think Trump is setting up for, which I think is really dangerous, really dangerous, because 
Trump won this election, which means that as many of us thought that Trump couldn't win it, right, because they was just crazy. He's an idiot. There's no way, right? That was the language that people were using. But Trump did win this election, which says to me there are some smart people behind Trump who are tracking the numbers. And those smart people see exactly what I see, which is that the DNC is losing the black vote and that will make it more difficult for them to, to win elections over the next eight to 12 years. But more importantly, I notice that Trump doesn't like to go after black people. Do y'all notice? Like he will, but it's always a step beyond saying black folks, right? It's like urban, inner city, gang problems, right? But like he's like, he's trying to walk that line. And the reason I think he's doing that is because I think the Republicans are setting up for figuring out what argument they could make to shift the black vote that is disenchanted with the Democratic Party to Republican. Now, there's no way that Republicans are going to do anything that's positive for black people, but what Republicans can do is go back in there, reach in their little wheelhouse, toolhouse of things that they like to do, which is create racial conflict in order to ensure vote. And so what I am worried that the Republicans are going to do is that they're going to use immigration as a wedge issue, particularly Muslim immigration, particularly Muslim terrorism, as a way to wedge the black voters who are concerned about that away from the party. And all they need to do is still 10 to 15 more percent of the black vote and the Democrats are dead in the water. Right? And the Republicans are very, very good at using fear tactics to drum up voters. And I think about that because I'm looking at my own father who's a Vietnam War vet who has all kinds of things to say about these Muslims coming over here trying to blow up the country he built. Right? And I, and I fundamentally realized that's a good tactic for the Republicans. Right? You pull that because if the DNC shifts to trying to go after black millennials, the Republicans can go after this civil rights age group, but they're going to have to work really hard at it. They're not going to be able to capture them all, but they don't need to. They just need to peel away, peel away layer by layer at the ability of the Democrats to capture the black vote. It's the same thing that they're doing with the Latino vote. Right? You see how then dangerous this can become. Right? We may not be able to kick a Republican out of office for the next 12 years unless the DNC gets smarter and hire smarter people. Um, because they need to be able to strategically think rhetorically about how they, what changes they need to make to shore up their vote and then how we can start slicing away at the Republicans. Right? The DNC can't be worried about sustaining its base and slicing away at the Republicans. That's why it loses elections. Does that make sense? So right now is the critical time. The DNC needs to have some people in place right now who are working right now amongst black millennials. They need to get out there in these organizations like the Movement for Black Lives. They need to get people invested in the Black Lives Matter movement and stop trotting out these moms because that's not good enough. Right? That's just a, that's like a political ploy that everybody recognizes. That's a media, media spectacle. If Hillary had been going to visit black college campuses on a consistent basis, had showed up at Black Lives Matter meetings, had went to speak to actual black millennials and let it be recorded and take the pain, because they're going to give you some fire. Because these, these are not civil rights generation black people. Right? They're not going to be nice to you. They're going to be like, what about that super predator comment, though? Explanation, please. They're going to be very direct, but if Hillary could have handled it, if she could have handled it, she would have gotten so much more respect from black millennials, and they could have definitely gotten behind her. But she was running scared of a lot of this, and it happened too late, and the things that did happen were all media ploys. It was not good enough, and this generation will not be kowtowed by DNC explanation. They are actually very smart, and they are very thoughtful. And they've been raised by black people who have told them the history, right? So now they just, they like that your gradualism approach is not going to work for these people. They're like, no, gradualism. You will do it now or we will not vote for your candidates and we will cripple your party, right? That's, that's called taking power in your hands, right? So that's where we are, right? Where these kinds of conflicts over the next eight to 12 years are really possible. Right? I am not sure that Trump would lose a re-election campaign. And I know people really want to believe that something drastic is going to change before this election comes up, but I'm going I'm to put I'm gonna state my reputation on it right now. Trump's going to win again. He's going to win a second time. 
because all of these things are true, everything that I've just said, but also because Trump supporters, they generally don't care what Trump does. Right? As long as and Trump's all about the fake news and he's got great explanations for why everything that they're actually reading isn't true. You know, this is the making like this is fascism. Right? This is the making of a fascist nation that we are watching happen before our eyes. And I don't think that we have figured out how to respond to it quickly enough to prevent it from happening for another four years. So y'all strap in uh, for eight years of a Trump presidency. Okay, I'm going to stop there and give you all a few minutes to ask me questions. I talked for a really long time, but I hope that that at least gives you a really good idea of what I think is the relationship between anti-blackness and politics and what the stakes in the game are. <laughs> Sweet. Questions? What do you think about the congressional races next year? Uh, I think that the congressional races are actually in a much better situation, right? I think that, the, I think that people are sick of presidential elections at the black, black millennials in particular because they don't trust uh, government at that level and they recognize things don't really move for them when it comes to the president. But I do think that they are concerned about local level politics and congressional seats. And the reason that's become important is because as Black Lives Matter uh, grew in a lot of places around the country, they were simultaneously attempting to build social political networks to run people for local offices. So we've actually seen the election of some Black Lives Matter activists around the country in local level elections. What I am assuming is going to happen is that's going to increase to the congressional level as Black Lives Matter develops itself as a political machine, which I think is exactly what it's going to do. Because it fundamentally understands that it has met an exigent circumstance. It can draw in voters, actually, because of its uh, it's sort of power to draw in people's attention, but also because it's very uncompromising. It's what Frank Wilderson calls um, unflinching paradigmatic analysis, right? It is a direct attack on the structure. They will not be kowtowed by people who say one thing and do something different. So at the congressional level and at the level of local politics, that may be where we see a re-envisioning, a re-imaginationing of what the American political system is going to look like. But I don't think it will happen at the level of the presidency. Yes? I have a question about your um, thing about the grammar of suffering. The, the thing about the grammar of suffering. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about the, um, the couple times you kind of drew a distinction between mm -hmm. uh, the black grammar of suffering and the white grammar of suffering. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, I guess what I would say is I, I, kind of, I tend to think of um, all those things that you kind of uh, indexed or enumerated that. Um, make up black suffering would also include um, a pretty extreme uh, historical experience mm -hmm. of alienated labor. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, not, not only the stolen labor of slavery, but mm -hmm. also kind of like post-Great Migration, industrial, mm -hmm. belt, like, you know, like the black, the radical black worker tradition, that mm -hmm. whole thing. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could say... Absolutely. Absolutely. So what I think the Afro-pessimists are attempting to do is to, uh, they're attempting to engage the Marxists, really. And so what they're trying to draw on is this idea of Marxian grammar of suffering as one that is alienation and exploitation that describes the experience of the worker. And what they want to do is make a distinction between the worker and the slave. Right, so alienation and exploitation can describe the experience of the worker in relationship to industry, to capital, for example. But the Afro-pessimist argument is that the black doesn't stand as a worker because the black's first relation to the state and to civil society is one that's constituted by its slaveness and not by its worker status. So even if we're talking about, say, you know, black workers of a particular period after slavery, Afro-pessimists would argue that Yes, the dynamics of worker class status is important, but that is not enough to explain the experience of the black worker that is marked by its slaveness, even if slavery has, does no longer exist. And so the, what they want to try to get at is we understand exploited workers, right? We understand 
forcing people to work for very little money, for long hours and poor conditions. Those things we understand as suffering. Those are things that our nation has worked really hard to try to deal with, like child labor, for example, right? These are things, that kind of alienation and exploitation is something that our nation tries to grapple with and deal with in very effective means, right? We try to pass policies. We try to change the nature of our, uh, of our relationship to work and workers, et cetera. Now, that does not mean that globalization and capital is it all good for the worker now, right? But at the very least, we understand that kind of suffering and we understand that we can move in ways to try to resolve that. What, what, the, what we're trying to argue from the Afro-pessimist perspective is that, yes, the black can experience alienation and exploitation because they are also workers, but that, that experience of alienation and exploitation is markedly different because they also are simultaneously experiencing accumulation and fungibility, i.e. the relationship of being bought and sold. So there is, particularly when you think about fungibility, let's move it forward, right? So we talk about hip hop as a sort of music industry. And for like 15 years after hip hop developed, everybody who was writing about it was all caught up in its commodification, right? It's been commodified, you know, the biggest buying audience for hip hop music is young white teenage males, right? So it's been disconnected from the culture. It has no meaning. This is what all of the, the criticism is about it. But I think that what's important to understand is that that is that is blackness itself. That is blackness's relationship to whiteness and white society is for it to be fungible, for us to be able to be sold to you. That, that's why commodification exists. Like commodification is inevitable with anything black people produce with anything a person of color produces in relationship to white society because white society eats that which it wants and destroys that which is in contradiction to itself. So our, my point to try to draw on here is, yes, the worker is exploited, right? But the black worker in particular faces a kind of, a kind of accumulation like let me let me have you right and then fungibility i can sell you right but and that's because, partly because their life has has no value in the context of american civil society even in relationship to the worker one other example i want to give you which is why uh which is why i suggest that if you if any of the things i've said are interesting that you go back and get um frank wilderson's uh red black and white is it red white and black white red i can't remember is it red black and white does anybody know anybody i think it's red black and white I'm pretty sure it's red, black, and white. So go back and get, actually I got my, let me just see. Yeah, it's red, white, and black, sorry. So get Wilderson's red, white, and black, because I think the most important sentence out of that book for me um, comes in the section where, where Wilderson is engaging a gombin on a uh, bear life in the Musulman. And um, what, uh, what Wilderson says is that the black, the, this is what Wooderson says. The African got on the slave ship, an African, but landed in America and became black. Does that make sense? So the black loses any connection to culture or history, right? It loses all of that because in its move from African subject to black object, there's something significant there that is lost. And that from then on, our relationship to American civil society and the state has been one of trying to become human, to become citizen. But the end result is that we're always shy of that. You can never be fully citizen. That's why racial profiling is real. You can never be fully human. That's why our lives don't matter. Right, that's where we are. Yeah. I guess this whole talk was kind of really disturbing because mm -hmm. like the language continues to kind of perpetuate the white rhetoric about black people. And it's almost for fun when they think, keep saying it over and over again. And so I'm wondering um, what does, you know, so we have the grammar of black people, the grammar of slaves, the oppressed. Mm -hmm. What does the grammar of white terrorism say? Because it's it's quite clearly this is what all these people represent, but they're not speaking. Mm -hmm. We're speaking to them, we're telling them about our suffering. But they're not speaking back and talking about what their responsibility is for that stuff. 
Well, I, mean, I, mean, I, think, I think you assume that they have some responsibility. Well, they absolutely do. That's what I mean. And I'm, my argument is that they don't. It's not, it, it, but I'm going to explain why and what we mean by responsibility. Yeah. It's not that I don't think that white people should be not racist or n not engaged in acts of racism or that they should not deal with the fact that they have privilege. But my argument is that when we decide that white people have to be responsible and do something, that we've decided that they can do something, that they will do something or should do something, but that assumption in and of itself is one that assumes that they understand blackness enough to know what to do. And my point isn't that, they, that we shouldn't figure out what to do, it's that in a context where there is no grammar of black suffering, what white people choose to do is to respond to us as if it's alienation and exploitation. What that looks like is diversity programming to resolve structural racism. And so my argument isn't that diversity programming is bad, right? We should be more diverse. There should be more people of color represented in a university context. But my argument is that because we understand that grammar of suffering as alienation, exploitation, so what we need to do is bring opportunity and access, that that response to anti-blackness is doomed to failure to resolve anti-blackness yeah, itself. So that's not what I'm suggesting. So I don't have nearly as much, you know, I guess, language to describe what you are. But say I talked to African um, storytelling for mm -hmm. last semester, and they continually kind of put this blame on the African, mm -hmm. the Nigerians, mm -hmm. um, Cameroonians, people. And it's like they don't see themselves as terrorists. They don't see themselves as responsible for colonization. They don't see themselves responsible for genocide. And so in response to the language that you're talking about, where do they, where does their voice come in? Because when I imagine the debates, no, they don't need to necessarily study what I'm studying. They need to go study what their people did to our people so they can begin to have some kind of logic to understand what kind of responsibility they have for the alienation, for the exploitation that we experience. Because otherwise, we're just like talking and they just continue to look like this. Like with these blank, these like blank stares, like, well, I don't know what to say. Go find out what language to describe what, not necessarily you as an individual, but what your ancestors did, what you are responsible for. I think that's what this entire talk has been about, which that. is like, that's why I talked about the white futurity argument, right? Well, you might not have been here for that part of the I conversation, have, but, but when I, did you hear me talk about white futurity? All all I, heard, I don't know if they did, because all I heard was a But I can't control what they hear. But we, I cannot I'll, control what white people them. think. What I can do is get them to understand that they have produced the, the stuff that is negative that I'm talking about. You have produced terrorism. You have produced climate change. You have produced war. That is something that white people have produced. That is a production of whiteness. That is what white culture produces. When did they speak back is what I'm trying to understand. It's not their time to speak. This is my time. But I'm in time. This is my time. This is my time. We're always talking to them. That may be true for you, but that is not true every for me. Every time I go to talks, black people are talking to white people. They're sitting there looking at us, wondering, oh, what responsibility? They don't ever talk. But that's not my responsibility here right now. What my responsibility here right now maybe, is. Maybe I'm saying you said. Can I finish, finish speaking? Yeah, since I, because this is this is supposed to be my time to talk. Okay. Time. So what I think is important for white people to do is white people are not used to people being honest with them. So when black people stand up to come talk to white audiences, often we try to control what we're saying because we're concerned about white sensitive feelings, right? Them being emotional in response to what we say. Mm -hmm. It's why. I decide to present the way that I do, which is I have no empathy for white people when it comes to what they have produced. And the reason that I speak to them in a very direct language, which is your futurity should not be guaranteed. The question is whether or not you deserve to live. That question in and of itself is incredibly disruptive from a lot of white people who are sitting in this room right now, because they're going to have to walk away and think, why would she say my life doesn't matter. Why does my future not matter? Why is the likelihood that we may, re may reach extinction and white people might die, why does that not matter? And I want them to question that because they need to know that black people don't care about white futurity because our lives have never mattered here. So our job is not to protect them. I'm not trying to save them, I, I but I want them to walk away with that question. They're not, they can't speak right now. What are they going to say to me? What, what I'm saying, I'm talking and I'm saying this is I guess we're hearing it slightly different. I'm not trying to be apologetic to white people. I'm not asking. Oh, I'm fairly it. sure that that's clear. Yeah, what with I'm you. trying to say is, can they accept some response? In this room, everything that you said, 
Do they ever accept if we if, if they accept responsibility right now, that's a platitude to make us no, feel better. No, it's not. Because to me, it's a platitude if they're quiet, walk out of here and keep thinking. When you've invested all this time thinking about what they've done to us, but they don't have to. Respond. But I didn't invest that time for them. You would, but you're telling me what I already know, and they still. Have I'm not telling. I'm, but some people don't know, and that's what I do. Is I teach black kids how to make these arguments, how to use white people's resources and institutions against them. That's what I spent my time doing. What this is useful for is it gives me an hour to talk about my research, which I am recording on my laptop, because then I'm going to go home and transcribe this for the introduction to the book. It is not about what the white people will learn from us. It's not, that's not why I do this. If this was about what white people learn, I would not even be here. If it does not help black people, it has no place for me. I'm just, I don't understand how them taking responsibility for what they did and doing something to repair it is ever going to like I you just said in terms of Afro pessimism. I don't think it can be repaired. I think I'm saying I think it can. I, and I think everyone in here thinks that too. It's just a matter of how you look at it. If they take so if they say I'm a terrorist, I am my, I'm a colonizer. I'm, I'm, that's what this is. Do you think that will prevent them from engaging in terrorism or colonization? If you're a human being, it will not. Well, that's what I'm trying to tell you because they are human. Well, Listen, they are human. Whiteness is humanity. No, that is how it's defined. People who won't do it, then you're not human. That's actually subhuman to not think I have responsibility. You're, we're missing. We're about. mixing languages. We're right. talking yeah. on different. We're talking on different intellectual registers here. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is, they are human. We are not. Not because we are not human to black people. I am a human, and so until they acknowledge that I'm a human, they are not human. So I'm saying the exact. That is the flip that I think yeah. that black people are trying to make, which is what an alternative way of viewing the world okay. is. I agree with that. Okay. But what I'm saying from the, in their reality, we are not human. In our reality, we got black life. Right. We are human. Matter of fact, we the best that humanity has to offer. Because our cultures have been designed to maintain life, to maintain societies, not these structures of government societies, but real life, communal practice, love, I, education, I right? That is the life that we have defined. That still haven't said anything. I think that kind of proves what That's I'm because saying. you have taken over the conversation. No, I'm opening it up. I'm saying, when are you going to take responsibility? But they are not going to do that. And I'm trying well, to that's, explain that's to you why, why they're not. We keep talking to them if they're not going to do anything. About because it. it's useful for me. That's what I started yeah, off from I saying. I think it could, if you continue to hold them responsible, I think that's when it becomes useful. Because I'm talking about. How many of y'all heard me say you're responsible for climate change and the extinction of humanity? But when did they speak and take response? You told them that. Because, because they, they need to go speak somewhere else. This is not their space. That's why they're not speaking. This is a white institution. I'll make up less than 3% of this population. But I'm in charge they right now, and they will sit here and listen to me that's, speak. That's because they hardly speak. ever it's have to. Listen, time. listen. You are taking no. over this whole talk, and you're speaking over me. If you want to communicate about this, then I'm give me. The, then you need to sit down because you're not even letting me speak. It's you're not even it's letting me speak. Dialogue. You're not letting me speak. You're talking over me. Because you won't let me speak. If you want a dialogue, you have to listen to the other person. When you're speaking, I am actually very quiet because I'm interested in the perspective that you offer because it is an alternative one. The one I've presented is one that represents the structure of their reality that I am critiquing. What you're presenting is the alternative, which I think is the where we are shifting as black people. But you don't get to come in and take over and not listen to what I'm attempting to explain in my response to you, which is what you are doing. You are talking over me. You have to listen to what my explanation is. Now, if you have a question that you want me to directly respond to, I will do that. But you have to let me respond. I'm not going to let you take over this moment. Well, I'm thinking so what's the question? Listen, listen to you. I guess my question is, when does the dialogue happen between what we're saying and what they're not saying? What do you all think? I have a question. Yes, um, Pumpkin. You spoke uh, earlier about how the democracy can exist with this, like, the we have Afro-pessimism. It's really not Afro-pessimism as much as it's anti-blackness. So, so basically, if you think about it like this, I'm sort of building on Franz Fanon's work. And Fanon's a really good, interesting read if you have time. But it is sort of difficult to read to some extent. But he's also building on psychoanalysis. And that's Freud and all of that kind of stuff. We're not going to go there. But what he's trying to sort of get at is 
this idea that in the development of American society, but even before that, right, when we're talking about the development of European society and when Europe, Europe meets Africa, for example, the, how, how Europe ex describes its experience meeting Africa, right? So Africa gets labeled things like the dark continent. Uh, we, it's, the, it's the continent of, you know, animals or ignorant people, people who need Europe, right, to get them in order to build civilization because they were just out there in loincloths with like sticks or whatever that's how Europe envisioned Africa and so it allowed then for Europe to conquer parts of Africa to do things like build the slave trade etc but simultaneous in order to do that like think just think about it for a second I just want everybody in the room to think about it for a second think about what you have to be mentally to enslave another human being to torture them to take their families away from them to watch them go through innumerable harms and not fundamentally feel like there is something so wrong with you that you wouldn't want to kill yourself. Right, so how do you do that for a, for a whole, like, for hundreds of years and, for a, and for, a, for a specific culture, how do you produce that? Well, one of the things that you have to do is produce a narrative to explain and justify why you get to interact with people like that. So that's why the idea of Africa as the dark continent, these being ignorant people, when they come to America and get off the slave ship, we remove their name, we remove their culture, we put people who don't speak the same language together to work fields because we don't want them to be able to replan resistances, right? So then we build up narratives around that. You, we make laws, you can't read and write, but then we call you stupid. Right, so what we're talking about is the actual material structural things, right, that white people put into place to justify slavery given that this is a Christian nation. Does that make sense to you? Those things were very much so in conflict, so they had to come up with explanations. What I'm saying is that those explanations, those fundamental practices of understanding black relationship to white, that those things get reproduced in the very development of the Constitution itself and how we understand and think and define our relationship to freedom. So for example, founding fathers would often make the argument that they were like slaves vis-a-vis -vis their relationship to the British. Does that make sense to you? So in order for them to understand what freedom meant, they needed the slave as the marker of the non-free. So what I'm saying is that our very society, how we understand democracy, how we even understand how to constitute freedom or citizenship, that all of that is built upon a necessary relationship to the black as not that. It is the negative differential that makes freedom coherent. It is the negative differential that makes citizen coherent, right? Without the slave, our democracy has no coherency. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're trying to get at. Not that it's, it's not that I'm a slave right now, right? But I am marked by slaveness because our society still marks race. That is the world we live in. And it is not something that we can, I can't teach you a diversity class and try to make you feel kumbaya with black people to resolve that. That's not how we can resolve the issue. You can like black people and still be hella anti-black. Right. You can like hip hop and soul food and still be hella anti-black because you engage in structural actions. Mm -hmm. Oh, does this black woman who we're interviewing for this tenure stream job, does she fit with the department, right? Those are the kinds of structural decisions that get made that lock black people out of any numbers of places and makes the things that they experience on a day-to-day -day environment, for example, in the academy, make the process so difficult. It is a struggle for every black person in this room to be on this campus on the days that they're here. Because black people face racial microaggressions everywhere. So what we're trying to get at is getting, it's, my goal is to try to get white people to question it's like I think somebody said the other day to me it's like white people just it's like you just feel like the world was made for you and so you walk around in the world with that with that performance of attitude whereas black people know the world wasn't made for us not this world and so we walk around with that knowledge and that, those are two different experiences. But because you can walk around in the world with the knowledge that the world privileges your experience, 
that the world sees you as the good, right? Whereas black people have to walk around as they know they're the good, but the world sees them as the bad. So in order for us to be successful, we have to overcome the ready assumption you have about blackness already. And you reproduce that in everyday interactions. At the same time, trying to say that you're a liberal and I like black people. Go ahead, Pumpkin. So, uh, I think it's interesting that because like slavery has all the obviously existed like throughout uh, human experience, and then you can go back to like, Mesopotamia, and, mm -hmm. and they would enslave each other. But is it because that um, there was like that onus to make it like there has to be a justification that the, that in this instance when it was uh, black slavery, there's that justification, then that's how we got these like repercussions and how like it became black is bad and things like that. Is that That's a really good question and one I think that a lot of people ask because what do other kinds of slavery like slavery in other instances uh, throughout human history sort of where do they fit in our understanding of uh, anti-blackness and that's why I wanted to give you that example of uh, Wilderson talking about the slave ship right so the African went on the slave and African became off the boat uh, a black and that is fundamentally the distinction that we're trying to get at here which is Slavery in other contexts, often you saw slavery, and slavery changes depending on different cultures throughout the world and throughout the, their particular history. So some slavery like conditions, right, look very different than what it looked like in American slavery. Um, and uh, other like, you know, and there are other people who own slaves. So for example, Arabs own black slaves as well, right? So th all of that history is important. But what we want to focus in on here is how color becomes attached to condition. Right, because because if you if we enslaved portions of white people, right, if you know that slavery became illegal and we started to shift those people into our broader culture, we could pass them into our society in a way that would not make it obvious, right, that they had a slave background. But because color is such a phenotypical marker, it makes it easier for us to attach things to it. Right? So this is, color, attaching things to skin color is as stupid as attaching it to eye color. Right? That's, that's the point. But, but it, it is, coloration is useful in our society still because it structures our democracy. It structures our civil society. It's why we have not moved past color difference being a marker of anything. Right? Me looking at you as a white man, that cannot tell me anything about you. Not really. But I can tell you about how you fit in the structure and what your, how your life is likely to be different from someone who is black, even if they were economically situated in the, in the structure in the same way as you. And it's because color carries meaning, right? So we can all feel like, you know, we don't want to, that we, most white people don't want this to be the world they live in. Like you don't want this to be true. That's part of the reason why it's hard to convince you it is. Because you do not, if, the, if what I am saying to you is true, then you are a fucked up person. Mm -hmm. White people are fucked up people. That's what it means. That's why, you can't, that's why you don't want to internalize that. And what I try to get white people to understand is you have been raised to be that. The world was superimposed on your progression. That's what Ben said. Right? The world was superimposed on your progression. You were already white in the womb. And once you come into the world, everything that the world is now teaches you how to be in the world. That's why it's so hard to break it down. That's why it's hard to even convince you that you have any responsibility because you didn't own slaves. Right? That wasn't your time period. You didn't own slaves. You went out there with Bull Connor with no dogs and no water hoses and no, you know, that was not, you can't see, you don't see any responsibility for you because that wasn't you. Those were those other white people. And we don't believe in that. That's how white people treat it. Those crazy racist white people, that's not who we are, right? We believe in diversity. But at the same time, the very privilege that you just accept as the everyday way that you live your life, that does produce structural racism. That is what is sustaining anti-blackness. And that's why her comment is that you are responsible. And that's why it's frustrating for black people when they sit in conversations like this, because white people like to look at us and listen to the things that we're saying, but you get to walk out of this room and still be white. And you get to decide whether or not you are even influenced by anything that I've said. 
And that makes you dangerous to black people. Mm -hmm. So that's why she's having the reaction that she's having, which I get. Um, I'm 40, 41 actually, so I'm not like the undergrads, I think. But um, I'm a parent of three young girls. Mm -hmm. um, my wife is Latina. Um, my children are fair skinned. Mm -hmm. Could you give me some ideas or concrete things that I can do to ensure that my three girls are more aware of the privilege that I wasn't aware of until I was an undergrad? I think that uh, I, I, I'm actually, I'm going to answer a different version of that question, I think, and say this. Um, I think you should make your daughter's lives as of color as possible. Um, and so for me, I have a three-year-old little black girl, and I am well aware of the history of how white America treats little black, uh, young black women. And it is very important for me that as much as possible, I control her access to whiteness. Because white culture teaches little black kids that they are not smart, that they are not beautiful, etc. So, for example, um, I got my daughter an iPad because we got it for like fifty dollars when we bought our new iPhones from AT and T or whatever. They were giving them away, so I was like, "Cool." So she has this iPad, and before I realized there was a YouTube for kids and a PBS for kids, I just had her on YouTube. I would type in Peppa Pig, and then she could scroll up and down on the rest of the videos and see whatever else she wanted to play. So one day we were in the car. And I'm sitting in the back seat, it's the whole family, mom, dad, grandma, I'm in the middle, sitting next to the car seat, grandma on this side. Tinkerbell's looking at her iPad and some video comes on and I'm looking at it and I'm like, oh, it's the, um, it's like one of these nursery rhyme songs or whatever. So I'm watching the video and all of a sudden, this, these two little white kids who are dressed in like teddy bear costume outfits, I think it's called Dave and somebody or whatever. They're dressed in these teddy bear costumes, they're real cute, two little white kids. And the video is about, um, uh, some kind of fruit basket, banana, something or other that you sing to kids. Oh, apples and bananas, right? So it's the apples and bananas song, right? So it's like, I like to eat, eat, eat. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Apples and bananas. Okay, so that song. Right? So she so said they're doing the song, right? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes all of these little black monkeys who are all dressed like children. The little girl monkey has her hair and a hairstyle exactly like my daughter's. And the little monkeys, five of them, looking like baby's kids out the, you know, what you would think of. Y'all don't know nothing about baby's kids. I'm talking about two white people. Y'all, I'm talking like, like what you would expect of a welfare queen mom who's had like five children. They all acting wild because they ain't got no home training. That kind of stereotype, right? So these little five little uh, these little five little monkeys are running around and looking like little black kids, and then they dancing and having a good time, right? But they dancing like black people, right? And they steal the basket of fruit from the two little white kids. The two little white kids start crying. I was like, oh no! <laughs> you may not watch that video because I understand fundamentally what they have just tried to teach my little black girl that she is a monkey. That's what it does. That is how white society operates. So my suggestion to you is, I buy my daughters, they say that your kid needs to have more than a thousand books in a household for your household to be a literate household, right? So when I tell you that we do not allow white baby dolls in our home, we do not allow children's books where white people are more than 50% of the character ratio, um, my daughter watches a lot of Doc McStuffin, but I also buy African videos that are in English that are, that are made for cartoons that are made for kids of color, right? You have to be on it. This society will teach your little girls to be white even though your wife is Latina because they have lighter skin privilege. And it will not teach them not to engage in the same things that we are talking about here. Right? So you've got to restructure. Y'all got to restructure. You got to structure your whole world so that this does not happen to your child in this way, that they don't become the white person that's the problem for people of color. Because they can very easily because it's easier. It is easier. It's how society functions. It's what they learn in the everyday. So I start replacing stuff. Like, and I'm, I'm like real stickler about it. Like, you don't buy my daughter anything with a monkey on it. Right? Anything that comes to our house that's closed with a monkey on it, that's going in the trash. Right, my partner made a mistake and bought uh, Love's Pampers, which have a little black kid on the box in the front to advertise it. But then when you open the box of Pampers, there's a monkey with a banana on it. I was like, oh no, those Pampers going in the trash. Let me go buy some Huggies. Follow up question to that. How are you navigating school? 
Oh my God, I'm deathly afraid. I have a three-year-old, so that's not a thing yet. And um, I've been lucky enough because I've been on two years sabbatical that she has not had to go to daycare or anything. So she has not been outside of a family member's hands since she was born. Um, so I am deathly afraid, right? I'm afraid of things like, I don't know if you all, you know, I want y'all as white people to pay more attention to things that just happen in black life. So for example, it's a thing for little black girls in elementary school to have their hair cut off by white female teachers. Like as a disciplinary thing, yeah. Ha has happened many times in this nation. Many times. And so I already know the first day that Tinkerbell is going to anybody's school where there are white women who are the majority of the teachers, we're going to have a conversation. Don't you put your hands on my child's hair. I don't care what she did. Call me. Right? Because I feel not, I really feel like as a black parent, that is a conversation I have to have now with white teachers. White teachers make assumptions about how black students engage in class. For example, blackness as a culture is loud and rambunctious and beautiful and open and communicative. It is joy and color. 